A bevy of macroeconomic forces come into focus as HPE CEO Antonio Neri returns to the show following the company's most recent earnings. We dive into the company's recent triple-digit growth in GreenLake, as well as the rapidly growing order backlog. We also discuss the company's recent GreenLake event, where Neri and his team announced a series of new services for the company's cloud that comes to you. Tune in. All this and more on this episode of Making Markets. This is the Making Markets Podcast, brought to you by Futurum Research. We bring you top executives from the world's most exciting technology companies, bridging the gap between strategy, markets, innovation, and the companies featured on the show. The Making Markets Podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only. Please do not take anything reflected in this show as investment advice. Now your host, Principal Analyst and Founding Partner of Futurum Research, Daniel Newman. Antonio Neri, CEO HPE, welcome back to Making Markets. Well, thanks for having me again, Daniel. Yeah, it's, it's super exciting. And this, by the way, is great. Over the last few months, I've finally had the chance to sit down face to face a few weeks ago um, with one of your partners, with Pat Gelsinger in, oh, yeah. at Intel at their uh, Investor Day. Live, I got to see uh, Cristiano Amon with Qualcomm live, and you. So you're like the third out of like more than 30 episodes that I've actually gotten to sit down. Well, so. that's great. Great you get him back with people face to face. You can't replace that uh, interaction over the digital aspects of what you do. No, it's so nice, and and I can still think back to about three years ago, last time I saw you live on the big stage. I'm going to talk to you about that later because yeah. we've come full circle. It's, it's been three back. It's three big back. years. Discover is is coming back, but no, it is great to get here live. And by the way, we are sitting in the beautiful new headquarters, yeah. Houston, Texas. Um, now both of our homes, I'm in Austin, but both, both Texans, but man, what a beautiful place you guys are building out here. Well, we are really proud. Well, thanks for coming to visit us in our home, uh, but we're really proud of what we have built here. Uh, it has taken us a little bit of time, but we have given to our employees a state of the art digitally enabled um, you know, site, which is a wonderful experience for the more than 2,500 employees we have at the site. So really proud because this is my second one, right? If you recall, uh, we built the one in San Jose and we are now completing the one in India and Bangalore, which is for 12,000 employees. Yeah, it's gonna be beautiful. I do also remember there was one here that was built that didn't make it for very long because it right afterwards there was the the hurricane and it flooded out and so i was here for that grand opening here in houston so uh, there's been a lot of of ups and downs but this is a big up and this place like i said i walked up beautiful i mean san jose was super nice is super nice that yeah. facility is beautiful but this place just kind of it feels like you guys are well, making we get home. the best of both worlds daniel right so we built a uh, again a state-of-the-art site in san jose in the middle of Silicon Valley, right, where you have to be when you think about thought leadership, long-term vision, you know, architectures of the future and whatnot. And there we have a now a great presence all in one, you know, converged site. And here in Texas, we brought the official headquarters, but also we do a lot of innovation here, right? Let's not forget that we do a lot of compute here, services as well. So. We get the best of both worlds, um, and uh, you know we learned a few things about the San Jose site, and we built it here. Uh, but again, really proud of what we have done here. Yeah, absolutely beautiful. So there's a lot going on in the world, and it's yeah. great to have you back. Jeez, uh, it's only been a maybe three or four months since you were on the show, and the world has changed a ton. Yeah. Feels to some extent like we we may be kind of coming out the other end a little bit of COVID. I mean, crossing fingers yeah. because every time we've thought that over the last couple of years. There's been a surprise, but of course, at the same time, some serious macro events yep. going on. And I would probably not be doing my job if I didn't ask you first kind of your thoughts in HPE, how you guys are addressing what's going on yeah. with the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Yeah, before I get uh, to that, you know, I'm, I'm entering now my fifth year as a, as a CEO of the company, which has been a remarkable journey for me. Um, but, you know, as I reflect back, <laughs> Boy, I have managed uh, with my team, right? Crisis after crisis after crisis, right? Think about 2018, you know, we had floods here in Houston. You mentioned that early on. All sorts of natural disasters that impacted us, you know, in 2000. And by the way, we had at the time geopolitical tensions. 
2019, um, you know, we had other events, including the, the, the beginning of the pandemic in 2020. And now we have a major supply chain disruption and obviously what we see now in Russia, Ukraine, which is completely unacceptable. It was an unprovoked invasion for no reason whatsoever, no justification uh, for anything. And, uh, and we all need to stand up. Uh, so we as a company, what we have done first and foremost, taking care of the employees, as we we'll always do. And we don't have full-time HP employees in Ukraine, but we have uh, you know, so several dozens of contractors. So we have reached out to them and we are treating them not different than if they were full-time employees. You know, what help they need, whether or not they need to move out to the country, which obviously we have seen the humanitarian crisis where more than 2.7 million have now uh, left the country. So we are doing everything we can to help them and their family, even though they are not full-time employees. And we're working hand-in-hand -hand with those uh, agencies. And then on the other side, we don't need to forget that there are you know, several hundred people that we employ in Russia, and they have no part in any of this. And so they are also, obviously at the different level, suffering the same challenges because now they are totally isolated. And so how we pay them, how we keep them engaged is a problem. And we need to work together to make sure this crisis ends as soon as possible. And then, as always, you're right, we have to align to the global trade sanctions. But that, to me, was the last thing to think about it because, in the end, is the right thing to do, no matter what sanctions or not. And so uh, that that's has been our process so far. And as you know, Daniel, this changes every day. So my only hope is that the, the political side of this, together with us as a human being, we can go solve this problem. Yeah, I absolutely am hopeful every day. You wake up, I look at Twitter, I look at the news, I'm trying, you know, hoping for progress. Yeah. I'm really glad to see the response largely throughout the tech community. It's been remarkable. I mean, think about it, right? It's not just the response from the United States and the European Union, but all countries are large. And, you know, the, 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 the acts of all us as a human being, you know, basically sending a very, very strong message. But in the meantime, you know, the country is being destroyed and people are suffering. So that's why this has to end as soon as possible. Absolutely. And I'm glad that you mentioned the whole continuum of people affected because there are many people in both countries that yeah. have nothing to do with this. Like right. you said, the people you employ in Russia who are suffering in their own right as they've lost access and connectivity. If this doesn't get resolved, eventually this may have other consequences. Obviously, they are not suffering as, as the Ukrainian people, Different, which yes. some of them are losing their lives. Yes. And then they live in their homes, you know, going to countries they don't know anything about it. But, you know, it is a complicated matter. And uh, we live in very turbulent and, and uncertain times, you know, really worrying time. Well, I appreciate the fact that the company has taken its stance and done it proactively out of what it well, believes in rather than just because of an obligation. It's not just me as an individual. Obviously, when you are a CEO of a, you know, a Fortune 100 company, you have to stand up uh, and, and make your voice heard. But at the same time, it's aligned to our purpose, our values, who we are as a company. And listen, our employees are very vocal about this. And so one of the other things we have done is helping our employees around the region, particularly Poland, Romania, Slovakia, where they're willing to donate their time to volunteer to help these families, the refugees, right, um, to be taken care. So we have increased our, our volunteerism and supporting them with matching uh, funds because you won't believe it, but in the first 48 hours, we raised more than $200,000 for employees given to help these families. Yeah, that's, that's great. And I'm really glad to hear, I hope everybody out there, you know, is paying attention to the companies that are taking these events into their, their hands and doing meaningful things to help people who are, are suffering, because there is suffering. Sometimes here we're isolated in, like yeah. in the US from really feeling these effects. And thankfully, the media is able to expose us to it well, to some extent. But still, we're, we're still at Starbucks grabbing our, our coffees and you know, you're going to work and having dinner out and doing things and not realizing the world can be very cruel. So I appreciate that. On a macroeconomic note, just before I head in, because I want to talk, you guys have some really, you know, you've had some really big news at HPE, but I do like to take these chances when I'm talking to you. You know, we've got a lot of other external factors. This war just added to the complexity. Yeah. We're dealing with inflation through the roof. I mean, I'm 
building a house in Austin, I can tell you it's in, yeah. it is crazy what's happening to the values of homes, automobiles, luxury goods, but even groceries, gasoline, that's yeah, through fuel. the roof. You got interest rates rising, but then at the same time with the war going on, with economic, you raise rates, you, you know, what do you just kind of take a minute? Because I know we could spend an hour on this, but yeah. just kind of what are your thoughts on that overall environment? How do we how do we stimulate growth? Yeah, well, you know, I'm not an economist. Fair, <laughs> never, fair. never was Noted. and never be. Noted. Uh, but I lived in different times, you know, in different countries where we had high inflation and, and all the disruptions. So in many ways, I guess I have a lot of experience and also being part of a war, although it was, uh, uh, you know, at different times, you know, when the UK uh, and the Argentinians had the, the, the conflict around the Falklands Islands. But, uh, you know, it, 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 that's why I say it's a turbulent time and it's a certain time. Um, and I think over the next few months, we're going to see where we go from here because some financial analysts, right, and very respected analysts, they believe there may be a recession in the coming uh, year or so. I'm more optimistic because, you know, I see economy still growing, but, you know, it's growing in different areas than we have seen before. Obviously, services is a very important sector. Uh, manufacturing is coming back. Um, also because there needs to be some resilience in that supply chain. But what we see is data, data everywhere. And that data has so much value, so much value. Think about it, uh, Daniel, from the pandemic perspective, right? When the pandemic hit, everybody went work from home. The disruption wasn't that big, right? And we believe productivity was high. Although I believe working from home all the time is not the right thing, right? You need to have a hybrid approach. You need to have sites like this where people come, collaborate, innovate, socialize, right? You know, think about the challenge with mental health. You know, I argue if you work at the office, you will have less of those problems because at least you're not isolated. You don't have that anxiety. You and I can have this conversation or other people. But in any case, uh, what we see is the acceleration of digital transformation. And um, with our market team, we have done multiple analysis. And what we see is the brands that really accelerated the digital transformation are winning the marketplace. And the reason why is because they're using the power of the data they create, whether it's to improve their business operations or where to improve uh, the way they target customers or create new revenue stream opportunities. That's all obviously uh, improve their resiliency with cyber. But we see is a massive acceleration and that data has value, right? We talked before that I believe one day data will be recording the balance sheets of companies, not different than this building, you know, is, a, is an asset that the company has. And that's why Yes, inflation may have, have a, a, um, a, an impact, you know, what that growth will be. Uh, interest rate for sure, because cost of growth will be more expensive. But I believe us, as, a, as an information technology company that now plays in the edge, the cloud, and the data, we have a tremendous opportunity to help customers be more efficient, be way more outcome-oriented, and then obviously deliver better experiences to the customers and their own employees. And I believe that's why as a company, we believe we are extremely well positioned, but we have to navigate all these challenges, including the supply chain disruption we see today. Yeah, and the disruption, it sounds like there's parts of it that are easing and then you end up with a conflict like this and you end up with, you know, very specific materials that come out of, uh, yeah. you know, neon or palladium and you're like, oh my gosh, it's every part of the world actually touches the supply chain and the chips end up feeding everything. You can't build software on air. You gotta have yeah. the semis. Um, but I'm actually glad you pointed out the overall acceleration because my thesis has been that yes, an interest rate uh, increase might slightly compress valuation, especially for growth companies since well, everybody's, seen that. Since yeah. everybody's so forward. But I was yeah. gonna say, when you talk about recession, I'm like, we're already down in a lot of cases, very good companies are down 60, 70, and 80% off their highs. You know, we're talking about, you know, I had Kelly Steckelberg. Good time to invest in HP, I guess. I had Kelly Steckelberg, a CFO of Zoom, join me, and you know we're talking about that. Zoom was at almost 500 a share. It's at 100 a share now, yeah. and they've been growing. So what I'm saying is they're. There is a say, Daniel. Eventually, you have to make money, right? And so absolutely, and that's why the rotation of the market when you have these type of dislocations in the in the financial, you know, economic side of the house, is that people value growth, right? But, but at the same time, value also profitability. And those who can grow in a profitable way, at this time are being favored. We as a company, we know we are significant on their value because 
last quarter, right, we had that very nice growth yep. uh, in revenues. We obviously blew it off the roof through the orders bookings. Yep. Third consecutive quarter growing 20%, but we make a lot of money. And that money goes to shareholders, right? In one way or the other one. Yeah, whether it's dividends, whether it's buybacks, yeah. and, and of course, continued investments Invest. in your R&D and hiring Which people is and more growth. Return later on. And, and so you started my next question. I was gonna <laughs> ask you about that because you guys are just a few, you know, I think a few weeks now off your most recent earnings. We're yeah. very good. I mean, the overall, you know, and this is something, by the way, Antonio, I've been trying to feed the market for some time, whether I'm talking to, you know, whether I'm on CNBC or whether I'm, you know, having conversations in, in, in the back offices with HPE, watch the green light growth, watch the green light growth. Because, you know, when you got on stage and talked about switching everything as a service, that's where the business is going to grow. And whenever you go from rotating big CapEx to selling consumption, the top line may always have to somewhat slow in terms of that so you can change the buying paradigm. Right. So your numbers were outstanding in GreenLake, but just give me the quick recap of, of the quarter. Yeah, we had a very solid start for the fiscal year 2022, which as you know, starts on November 1st. Um, we had a solid revenue year over year growth, right? Uh, more than 5%. Um, and then we deliver fantastic profitability, right? It was 11% on operating margins. And, and in that, what we saw is the continued momentum in our orders bookings, which was 20% in the th three, third consecutive quarters in a row. Um, but to your point, right, we have a strategy to become the edge to cloud company that you can consume as a service. So we focus on four things, which are aligned to the mega trends we see in the market. One is the edge. The edge is here, where we live, where we work. And the need to have secure connectivity to the on-ramp to digital transformation is critical. Aruba is on fire. You know, this was the fourth consecutive quarter we grew 35%. And that business will continue to grow very, very rapidly. And we are driving a lot of innovation in that business that will sustain that growth. On the cloud side, obviously GreenLake. And this was the quarter that, again, we doubled the business year over year. We grew 136%. There was a very interesting chart there that shows the hockey stick, right, from five consecutive quarters of growth from the 20s to the 30s to the 50s to the 60s, and now 136%. And we have now, um, you know, more than, a, with the addition of Aruba into the platform from edge to cloud, more than 120,000 customers. Think about it. Before it was just the Green Lake, which was more compute and storage. Now we added the edge with the connectivity and we brought in more than 120,000 customers. And that to me is, is exciting because everything we do in this company will be all accredited to Green Lake because whether you buy it as a CapEx or as a OPEX, it doesn't matter in the end, you will be able to run your day one and day two operations to Green Lake. And the Green Lake is a true hybrid platform, where it also includes the aspect of the public cloud, which customers need one operating environment to run their business. Yeah, you, you sort of alluded to some of the new offerings, right? You have this big Green Lake moment that just happened on March 22nd. Yeah, I had the chance exciting to, day. Yeah, I had a chance to sit down with you as well on uh, my 6.5 uh, series with Patrick Moorhead, yep. and, but you know, this show, we don't tend to do as much of the product, but there was some great, I mean, you kind of talked about the acceleration, 130%-ish plus, I believe, yeah. 138. 136. Said? 136, yeah, I should memorize that, but you've only <laughs> said it twice. Now you've, now I've got it. But 130% uh, plus growth, I mean, just outstanding. And now a whole new diversified set of offerings. What was the real, you know, kind of catch moment of the announcement? Well, there were three key messages you remember. One is the unification of the experience across edge to cloud. And as I said earlier, right, now all the things we have done in Aruba were already a mobile first cloud first approach in a true cloud operating environment, plus our core business, compute storage and data coming together unified into one integrated experience under the GreenLake platform. And in there, we provide a consistent service for logging, monitoring, telemetry, billing, everything that you need to run your business. And whether you learn, try and buy, you go to the platform, right? And then you have an, an account called Daniel Newman, and you can see everything you consumed throughout the life cycle working with Hewlett Packard Enterprise, whether it was CapEx or OPEX. So to me, that, that was the first 
major step. And again, we have now more than 120,000 customers on the platform, which is very, very sizable. Second is the introduction of 12 new cloud services. And in that, we introduce NAS services, Network as a Service services, which is six of them as an extension of our Aruba portfolio with wireless, WAN, and LAN connectivity, which customers now, they want to consume the entire stack, not just the software subscription aspect, but the hardware and the services that come with it. And that's why we put together a network as a service offering, including the financing. And we have already customers on, on the platform using that, including the Home Depot. They are a very large network as a service customer. Uh, but now they can do it all through the platform. The other big introduction was our storage services and data management services, block of storage. Very much standardized set of offerings that you can consume the storage in a very elastic way. But at the same time, you know, all the data protection services that uh, we have had for some time, they are all available now in the platform. And then at the same time, we introduce new capabilities in the HPC space, including functions like GPU consumption, uh, Slingshot, which is an interconnect fabric to be able to run mission critical workloads at massive, massive scale. And at the same time, we also introduce our compute operations managers, which means, you know, we are here in Houston, Texas, the, the home where ProLiant was invented, and now you can run any of the ProLiant software services to manage the, the, the fleet, to deploy the fleet, to lifecycle manage the updates through the cloud inside GreenLake. So, very exciting. That was the second piece. And the last but not least, which I think is a very important point, we brought into the platform four key distributors. Uh, Take Data and Cinex, which obviously they merge also, which is a very big distributor in Europe, Ingram Micro and Aro. And so all of them now through their marketplace reach, fully integrated through APIs with GreenLake, now we can reach more than 100,000 value other resellers in the marketplace. And I think that's great. And, uh, and you know, if I can make two comments on what you just said, the first would be the, the provenance of GreenLake is important to point out to everybody out there because there are a number of companies, everybody's going to enter this as a service space. You were early, and I wrote about this numerous times, in, in, and I'm going to ask you about that in a moment, but three plus years ago when you, I think it was about three years actually, when you got on stage. Yeah, when you got on stage at the last in-person Discover and said three years, and I think the question was, is it really achievable? But the second thing is this kind of on-prem cloud concept. A lot of companies have done a piece here or a piece there, and they've launched a service to the market your portfolio has become very expansive, especially compared to everyone else doing the on-prem cloud, to where you're talking about you know, the various layers from control plane all the way out to the varying services, like you said, data services, GPU services, edge services, storage, network, yeah. compute, and where a lot of them, it's like, you know, right now it's just maybe one or two things. So you've got a, a nice head start, and of course, Everyone knows that when you're on top, the hardest thing to do is stay on top. Yeah. And if and there's a huge market, you're kind of competing with public cloud, but you're also their friend. You're kind of competing with the others. But um, at the same time, that provenance, that, that early arrival should really be noted that this wasn't something that you're doing just to me too. This is something you recognized early, you've gotten out in front of it, and that's worth pointing out. Just quickly on the partner thing, Antonio, I love that. I've asked for about a decade. I've wondered how these big partners are going to shift to consumption, and it's going to take companies like HPE simplifying and making these offers deliverable at scale because their model is selling volume, and they understand how to do that, but not necessarily how to, to make customers move from buying lots of boxes to software services and consumption, but that's what they've all wanted. All these big distributors have been looking for, how do we add margin, value, service, and, and right. stickiness to our customers when you know they're now subscribing to public cloud and they know they can swipe a credit card and spin up a workload and you're gonna help them get there. So that's that's Well, I think, I think all those are distributors and many, many other value other resellers, they have to transform themselves yes. if they want to be relevant. The one thing I always said is that Generally speaking, we're all important to customers because they're doing business with us. The question is how you become relevant in this new world. And relevance to me means when you have a big problem, who you think first? And then ultimately, are they capable to deliver a solution that deliver the business outcomes? And that's why GreenLake is so important because GreenLake is not the on-prem thing. GreenLake is a true edge to cloud platform. 
inclusive of the public cloud, by the way, yep. because customers have choice and a lot of workloads and data will live there and a lot will stay on-prem and, by the way, the vast majority will stay at the edge. But what they want is a true hybrid experience and that's why we call GreenLake the cloud that comes to you with all the services you need. And with the introduction of these uh, 12 services uh, just a few days ago, now we have more than 50 cloud services running on the platform, yeah. right? And that's important. But now we are in a cloud operating environment where services get deployed on a weekly or monthly or quarterly basis, not on a you know two-year basis like it used to be. Which before. aligns you quite a bit more closely to how the big hyperscalers have been doing this. And that's why I said like that is an advantage that's yeah. notable. And the other thing that customers really like um, is the fact that they have choice, access, and control, and flexibility, right? On the partner side, uh, you know, yes, before they had a lot of choice to sell, whether it's HPE, HP, Dell, and whatnot. Now they were reselling kind of the public cloud. But ultimately, that's not how you create relevancy. What we're doing with GreenLake is allow them to be relevant because they can bring the services on top of the platform and be the, the partner of choice for those customers. And ultimately, we know as we go through that deferred revenue, higher margins, they become way more profitable. And that's why they're excited to work with us, and that's why we brought four new distributors to the platform. Well, congrats on all the success. We've got about a minute left, and I'd, I'd be remiss to not ask you, it's three years. Like, when we get to Discover, in a couple months, it'll have been three years to the date from when you said this would be done, in the sense of it's never done, but you read everything as a service. Yeah. Did you meet your goal? And once that moment's hit, what is going to be the next story? Can you share anything on that? <laughs> well, I will not give you the, the, okay. the, the surprise, but I will say, reflecting back, right? So when I became CEO in 2018, I said the edge is the next frontier, and we committed to invest $4 billion over the next four years. We see the results of that in the growth that we see at the edge with our Aruba set of services, now part of GreenLake. 2018, yeah, like you said, right? We're gonna offer everything as a service through a platform type of approach. And we are pretty much complete on that. In fact, you know, we also architected, the re-architected the back end. People don't understand to be an as-a-service model, you need to have a whole different set of operations. It's not, you know, the typical build a product, you know, ship it and install it. You are operating in an outcome-based, SLA-based, and that's a whole different way to run your operations, which means your IT and process have to change. And that, to me, is a secret sauce that is, is gonna take others many, many years to catch up. It's not just the offer, but it's how you deliver that offer and the experience have to come together. It's each easy to copy the offer, you know, you can make an offer look the same, but if you have manual process on the back end, that's not a great experience. That doesn't mean you can compete with the public cloud. So we have done that. And what I'm excited, honestly, Daniel, is the fact that over the next few quarters, you're gonna to continue to see things like we just did a few days ago. But you should think about it more in the data space, right? More in the hybrid space, because ultimately that's where I think the value is. And that's why I always said, right, we enter the new age of insight. So stay tuned and I uh, hope to have a great event at Discover in June. Yeah, there may have been a hint in there, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> congratulations on all this Thank success. You. Uh, it's great chatting, great having you on. We'll have you back next quarter or two when we have a chance to talk about sure. how this momentum continues. Tony O'Neary, CEO, HPE. Thanks so much for joining Making Markets. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to Making Markets. Enjoy what you heard? Please subscribe to get every episode on your favorite podcast platform. You can also watch us on the web at futurumresearch.com slash making markets. Until next time, this is Making Markets, your essential show for market news, analysis, and commentary on today's most innovative tech companies.